Your welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Now, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy. You can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average and Auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts are having multiple vehicles in your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progress will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. For his casual insurance company affiliates, national annual average insurance savings by new customer survey to save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. And there's nothing going on tonight. We can't sit here like that. Or maybe just get drunk and stay inside. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. I am needlessly excited about this episode because these shows are really fun when I get to talk to someone I'm friends with and I get to promote something that I think is great. Uh, and today we have comedian Lou Perez talking about his new book. That joke ain't isn't funny anymore. It comes out this week. I'm very glad to have read it and have a signed copy. Uh, my first question, and this is a little bit esoteric, this is written for like center-right people, like in conservatives, about uh, comedy and, you know, this age of Trump and post-Trump. Did you really think conservatives are going to get the Smiths reference on this cover? Was it originally called Comedy is Murder? No, no. I, I came up with Comedy is Murder. Um, it, my, it was my publisher's idea to recreate the, uh, the album cover. So I was like, okay, cool. So uh, a friend of mine uh, in my house, we, we ordered like the helmet, um, a backpack, and we were recreating it. And then when it came down to like looking at, uh, at the, the shots that came out, I'm like, well, it says meat is murder. What else is, what, what can I put there? So then it, then it came up with, uh, with comedy is murder. But as far as like people, you know, not knowing the reference and all that, um, well, it's just reason enough to go out and buy the Smiths album. I guess. Are you a Smiths fan? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I want let's talk a bit about this book because there's a lot of really funny stuff in here. Um, one of the things that I think is just maddening is, you know, you're a stand up, you tour, uh, you do a lot of internet videos. The, the degree to which uh, Trump is, has to be the subject and punchline of comedy, even to this day, is something that I think um, I find very frustrating because it's just like when female comedians started coming up and they were all talking about their periods. Like after a certain point, it's just like, like, ladies, shut the F up. Like we get it. We get the punchline. Uh, can you talk a bit about that, how that affected the, the, your work in the last few years? Yeah, I think that, you know, here, here you had like this very easy target right and also a safe target that people were aiming at which was which was trump and you know i kept hearing you know all the people talking about how man you know it must be so easy to be a comedian now because the jokes just write themselves and it's like well you know the goal is not to let jokes write themselves the the, the goal is to actually have you know an, an insight uh and a new perspective and you know bring the audience somewhere where they didn't expect to go. And I think what happened is you had a lot of people who were sort of taking that route and saying like, okay, we're, we're just going to let the jokes write themselves. And then uh, that left a lot of room for like comedians like myself and, you know, friends of ours to say, okay, well, you guys aren't talking about this other stuff and making fun of that. We're going to, we're more than happy to do that. How has being like, there's this, I don't want to say weird, but it's because it's very normalized. But there is this basically political binary where if you do not think Trump is the worst thing that's ever happened on Earth, then somehow you're a Trump supporter and you're like a supervillain. Uh, how has that affected you in terms of like getting work and, and performing things like that, if at all? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's one of those things where you, I don't 
know how many doors have been closed because I never attempted to walk through them or, you know, even knew that, that, that they were, you know, possibilities there. You know, I sort of, I sort of decided, you know, five, seven years ago when I started dipping my, uh, you know, getting into political comedy and, uh, you know, being willing to open up and show my perspective that, Hey, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be who I am and say what I believe. And, and more than anything, I'm going to put out there what I think is funny and we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. And I think what I, what I kind of noticed is the more open that I've been and the more honest I've been, uh, with my views, um, the, my audience has grown that I think there are a lot of people out there who actually appreciate, you know, this, this view, at least when they come to me, they're like, okay, well, uh, at least Lou will, you know, try to be honest, you know, or try to, uh, at least, at least tell us what he's thinking as opposed to like, you know, just dish us complete insanity, you know, from one aisle or the other. One of the things that you're really good at on Twitter, um, people have this perception that blue pilled means Democrat and NPC means leftist. And there are plenty of right of center NPCs and you'll know them because they'll probably have, uh, in the same way that, you know, the leftists will have the Ukraine flag and a sunflower or, or something else, <laughs> they'll have the American flag and an eagle in their username on Twitter. Um, and, and they're very quick to defend Trump from absolutely everything. You have these tweets and you troll the hell out of them because you say things that are just, <laughs> to me at least, very clearly parodies of leftists. And they are just champing at the bit to trip themselves over and yell at you. Can you go over some of the biggest ones you've had that you've gotten people to bite yeah so um i think one of my f one of my favorites it's this it's this character who's come up it's basically he wears a black beanie and he wears glasses and uh, i wear contacts but they are actually my glasses uh and um uh it started off by by me by this character needing to speak out against spotify and joe rogan and uh he very clearly said you know Joe Rogan uh, has to answer for the role that he played in gain of function research, and he needs to answer for you know deciding to send the elderly back into nursing homes while they were you know co positive with COVID. He needs to answer for these, and Spotify, we need to get him off right right away. And so I do that, and I play it very real to camera. And what everybody you know starts pointing out is that on my actually. Show, Actually, yeah, actually, well, well, you have the ones who are like, Joe Rogan had nothing to do with that, man. He's a comedian. He's a podcaster, you know, so they need to correct me on that. But my favorite ones are the ones who pointed out what's on my shelf behind me, which is a, um, uh, well, it's a fisting dildo. And they're like, how can I take this guy seriously when he's got that in the background? And people would even like take still shots and circle it and be like, are you kidding me, man? Like, what do you, you know, what's going on with this? Wait, wait, and, the best thing, Lou, is that they think this is a gotcha. Like, right. oops. <laughs> yeah, like I was trying, like, yeah, like if this real if this guy was a real character, like he was trying to hide it. So he puts it right above his left shoulder, you know, right, you know. And um, but like it, it was it, it's amazing because like you said, you get to mess with those people, and then like the this whole story just starts getting larger and larger about who this guy is. So what I can I go get it just just yes. to show you that okay sure this is going to be a first on your welcome when someone displays on camera their sex toy well well now I'm a prop comic you know so <laughs> basically you're a modern day character what what are you, what are you pepper top I'm pepper top that's right oh my god salt and pepper top I'm going a little gray on there so so this is the guy right we got this guy right over here. And uh, it actually says on it, grab him by the pussy hand. It's uh, wait, wait, hold on. But honestly, like if I didn't know better, I'm not joking at all. That almost looks like um, like something from prayer. You know, it looks like yeah, hands oh, yeah the prayer hands. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't know yeah. that that's a sex toy. So you know, maybe that's the people are outing themselves. Yeah, I mean, does that out. look? I mean, at first glance, does that look like sexual to you? It doesn't look sexual to me at all. No, no. Um, no, it, it doesn't. But it, what 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 they what it did was it gave me the opportunity to then create 
you know, even more to this character. So I said, I said, look, you people are gross. You're disgusting. This is not a sex toy. This is not a sex toy. This is a resistance fist with extended fingers. And the fact that I am white, I am not able to actually give you a Black Lives Matter like fist. So therefore, this is how we do it. This is how white people show that they're allies by making this. And yeah, it just keeps going on and on and on. And it's so much fun. It's really, yeah, yeah, I cannot very much relate to this. It's amazing to me, and I say this with a bit of self-awareness, that there is an entire group of people of all political persuasions who get on social media for the express purpose of like finding idiots to belittle. And it's like, this isn't, talk about shooting fish in a barrel. Right. This is like shooting air in a sky. Like, I mean, they're literally everywhere. The, the hard part is finding people who aren't idiots. So it, it, it's just fascinating to watch. And sometimes I've retweeted you and I see my audience like take it at face value. And I'm just sitting there and I got to tell you, I'm disappointed by every single one of them. Because I don't wow. think when you're doing these trolls that you're being particularly subtle. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I think you're kind of, I mean, you're, you're so over the, t what was, there was something about the, pl the, the kids in the playground. I don't remember what it was. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So th there was one, um, same character. Uh, we went to a, um, <laughs> a one weekend I took my, my wife and our two kids, uh, to the local playground and I said, um, give me 15 minutes. I got to go shoot this thing. So I leave <laughs> Dad, them. Like, sorry, yeah, yeah. Daddy has to work. <laughs> yeah, daddy has to work. Okay. He's got to pay the, he's got to pay the bills. Uh, so I leave them kind of like by the monkey bars and then I go over to like a group of slides. I set up my, my, uh, my tripod. And then I say, I say basically, um, uh, today I came to my local playground to talk to kids about sex and gender. And the principal of the school told me to leave and I will not. She said that she is calling the police. And I said, fine, whether the police get here or the kids get here first, they're going to get a lesson in sex and gender. And it's like, so I shot that wall, like my kid, like my wife and my kids are, are, are out over there. I end the video with me going down the slide, like going down the slide, like my hands up. So talk about like, I totally hear what you're saying as far as like, you know, not being subtle about it. And man, the amount of people like, they're like, this groomer, man, right to the wood chipper. You know, it's like, oh man, if I found this guy, you better not talk to my wife. And like, and I'm doing that voice even for the women who, who I feel like the men and the women have like the same, like with the same attitude, their voice becomes the same exact, like tough guy, what? You know, I'll destroy this guy. And, uh, you know. Um, you, just like myself, uh, fled New York City. Now you're living in Jersey, you have a yard. Um, how often do you go back to the city? Um, I think I, I may, I may go back to the city of maybe like once a month for, um, for something. Um, and you know, like I, I, I listen to you, you know, I love it when you and Dave get together and you guys talk and I'm telling you, man, like the pain that the pain is so real. Um, and it's something where, you know, like I'll hear you talk about it and then I'll go back, like kind of hoping you know, like, ah, you know, maybe there was just like a, like a complete transformation. Maybe things are going back and it really hurts. It really hurts to go back into the city. Um, uh, a couple of weekends ago, uh, we were driving in, uh, we were driving through Manhattan to meet friends in Long Island city. So we we're driving through kind of like midtown and we're stopped at a light and who pops up, but squeegee guys. Yeah. Squeegee guys are back. And like, have I look, here. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's like a flashback. It's like Austin's trying to be New York 79. Yeah. You know, and these dudes, like they weren't young kids. Like these guys were so old, they might have been like the original squeegee guys. <laughs> it's and, the reunion. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we're back, baby. New York, we're back. And I and I, I didn't I didn't release it. I ended up recording something. I was just like, like, squeegee guys, are you fucking kidding me? Like, are you serious? And yeah, I mean that that that's what we're dealing with. You know? what, 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 for those of us, those in the audience who don't know what squeegee guys are, basically when your car pulls up to a red light, they come out and despite your protestations to the contrary, they, very, they, they, no, 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 they will wash your uh, windshield. And then if you don't give them money for it, they often get very belligerent about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or there, there will be something on whatever they're supposedly washing your windshield with and you're like dude you just made it worse you just made it yeah worse. yeah 
and it's um it's not exactly mr miyagi <laughs> right yeah, yeah. The, the the wax on the, the wax off and and yeah man i, I told my dad about it and he's like yeah and you can't hit him i'm like what he's like yeah you can't hit him man they're throwing you in jail I'm like well yeah i, I get that dad I'm like well, my dad's thinking like i'm gonna just you know run over this dude like, well dude. now that you're a dad he's giving you lessons to tell your kid that's right that's <laughs> right the kind of things so something that you alluded to in the book, which I which uh, I kind of very much appreciated, is you came up in the whole improv scene, you know, like what, like fifteen or, or years ago or so, like yeah. twenty years ago. And for the kids nowadays, there was this moment in the early two thousands when you had all these, you know, improv groups. Uh, they were making weird, quirky YouTube videos. Uh, and there was a lot of really kind of amazing, like out there stuff that came out of this. You mentioned being friends with Daniel Glover. Uh, he made what I think is one of my three favorite sketches. I forget what the the, the things the guy's name is. Is basically it's the scene where this kid craps his pants in high school and just keeps coming back in the room as a different person trying to get over the trauma, but he keeps doing it over and over again. And he's like yelling and crying at the same time. It's just an absolute lowbrow masterpiece. Can you talk a bit about what that era was like to you? Because it's gone now and it's not going to come back. This was a special magical time in New York. Yeah, and I think like all magical times you don't realize how magical it is until you're looking back and you're like oh my god um yeah so uh i i started doing uh improv and sketch comedy at nyu um as, a, as an undergrad and, and i was in a group with uh, uh with donald glover we were called um the wicked wicked hammer cats and a number of performers came uh came out of the really talented really talented people and um we graduated from there to the upright citizens brigade theater yeah. and for so many of my uh, my teammates, my castmates, like that was the pinnacle. I like, remember what that was like. Yeah. UCB. Oh my God. Yeah. And you're not getting paid, you know, but to be on that stage, to be able to perform was, you know, was, was just incredible. And, you know, at that time, like every night of the week you had improv and you had sketch and the really wild shows were the real late night shows were, which were kind of, uh, kind of open mics for for sketch comedy where you had no idea what was going to happen and there was just such there was such an atmosphere of of let's give it a try let's just try yeah. and if it fails whatever it fails um if if you bomb in front of an audience for 15 minutes whatever uh you know you're learning you, you know you're you're learning uh your craft you know you're 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 getting better and you're learning also to commit to commit to the role. And I think that that was really, uh, really, really important. And um, yeah, and, and you look back now and I'm like, uh, it's like, yeah, that that kind of thing isn't happening now. I mean, so many of the theaters are like, for one, the UCB doesn't exist in the EU. And um, I don't know how many other theaters are willing to, you know, give that, you know, to, I don't know, just to, to give a space for people to, to try out wild stuff. Yeah, I, I, a friend of mine did improv many years ago, and the scene was, okay, they're both Quasimodo, right? And the, his first line was, boy, there sure were a lot of black people in church today. Scene! And they just cut it. And there was recently a thing, I think it was specifically UCB, uh, my buddy was doing it, where they said, like, we want to get away from jokes that use, like, race or disability or social sex orientation as a punchline. And it's really kind of... Um, stupid because if you think about how many great you know female or disabled or black comedians came up they all dip in that well because it's something that makes people slightly uncomfortable but that's where, where comedy lies where the person's yeah. like am i allowed to be laughing at this yeah yeah i um uh, a friend of mine uh, he shared with me um i guess some new materials when it comes to like taking classes and stuff and they'll go over like Okay, if there's a if there's a, a two person scene, um, you're not allowed to you know play somebody of another race. Um, don't do accents, uh, especially if it's accents that, that might be yeah like accents that you might be like putting you know putting somebody down. And he's showing me this, and I can't believe it. You know, you know, having come up in that theater, and uh, it makes me th think back to one of the one of the the best sketches I've ever seen live. It was uh, Stephen Hawking with his with his wife. And Stephen Hawking is an abusive husband. 
so he's just abusing her the whole time like like fuck you bitch where the hell is my wine you know i i wanted bourbon what are you doing here you know and you know talk about like five minutes of that like uncomfortable but also but also like thinking like have you ever thought like yeah what if this guy was an abusive husband well, he, what, he, he, he cheated on his wife he was like an asshole oh i didn't know that yeah yeah oh yeah stephen hawking was not a great person and not only that the accent was wrong because he's british but the only the computer was set to like an american accent so it's completely wrong so like there's a lot of stuff to the stephen hawking story that's not what uh um he's cracked up to be whether you're a smoker or an ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is the perfect tool for you. Quitting smoking is the best thing you could do for your health, and Fume can help you get there. Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit cigarettes. No smoke, no vape, no nicotine replacement. What it replaces is that hand-to-mouth habit of smoking, which is that ritual, which is so hard for so many people to break. Fume is made of 100% Canadian maple. They have these cores infused with plant oils that are studied to curb cravings. Guys, smoking is expensive. At the very least, you're going to be saving yourself a lot of money. Quitting is tough, but Fume can really help. And they've got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who tried everything else. And this works. It's time to create positive habits and quit naturally Fume. And I'm glad to be a part of helping to make it easier. You're going to save on cigarettes you aren't buying. You're not going to have to buy breath mints. Your teeth won't be as yellow when you save on your initial purchase of fume. If you head to breathefume.com slash malice, B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M.com slash malice, use promo code malice, you get 10% off your order. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M.com slash malice and use code malice. Folks, you ever feel like you're being followed on the internet? Maybe advertisers know a bit too much about you. Well, our sponsor, IP Vanish VPN, is here to help you take back your privacy and help become anonymous on the internet. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short, and it's an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, even your Fire Stick if you stream media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, what you're doing, and that's important because what you're doing on the internet is no one's business but yours. And for listeners of this show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off their annual plan. It's only $375 a month. IP Vanish is super easy to use. Turn it on with one click. It runs in the background, helping to protect you while you're browsing the web. And if you run into a problem, boomers, no worries. IP Vanish has 24-7 support by email, chat, and phone. Go to ipvanish.com slash malice. Use promo code malice. M-A-L-I-C-E, to claim your 65% off savings, their annual plan, just $44.99 for the first year with our exclusive discount. This is the time to sign up because with our discount and their current promotion, you can get a VPN for 65% off the usual offering. And IP Vanish is the best of best with a 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot with more than 6,000 reviews. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash malice to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. Let's get back to the show. But the other thing, Lou, that, that you know, I, I want to hear your thoughts on, the reason people use accents, a lot of times it's a crutch and it's a hack thing, right? I'm going to do the Indian accent or the Chinese accent, right? Fine. But when you're doing improv, you have literally like three seconds to make the audience know who this character is. And using accents just pull from the zeitgeist of like certain personas. So right away, without having to do, you know, a lot of the work, which is the difficult part, establishing the character, the audience already knows, okay, I, I know who this guy is. Just like if I said, hey, honey, how's work been? You know, I'm just home from work. Like, you know who this guy is. Like, he's this right. 1950s, you know, businessman. And right away, they're kind of immersed in the scene. It, it seems to be really stupid uh, and counterproductive to comedy. Oh, 100%. And, you know, one of the mottos of, of the UCB was always don't think, you know, and now you have all the you, you wanted to get rid of all these barriers to really uh, to really connect to listen. Listening was so important um, in your scene work. And now you're adding all of these these barriers because you're like, if your first thing is, you know, like, OK, oh, honey, I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, what's for dinner? Yeah. And now and now you have to think of, oh, wait a minute. Um, I just got a note about uh, how it's wrong that every time a woman is in a scene, she's made to be a mother or a wow. wife. You know, and you're like, you know, where can you go from there um, if you know you're 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 putting all of these blocks in the way? Uh, and it, a very quick, easy scene would be if the, if the honey is was his gay husband, right? Right, yeah. right, right away you have, okay, a 1950s character, then you have like a contemporary character, you know, there's some place you can go with that. And, and you're yeah. kind of putting a twist on, on the cliche. Yeah. And, and, and also, I mean, even as we're, we're talking here, like, you know, we're both 
like excited over the possibilities, you know, we're, we're thinking back of stuff that we did see, but then also the possibilities that you have now that scenes that haven't been written before that have been created. And that's part of, you know, definitely the, f like just fun of it, you know, is just getting out there and going a little wild and seeing what happens. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the book was a few times early on where you bombed really hard. Um, I bombed at Tom Woods, a thousandth episode. I, I didn't realize how hard it is to do ventriloquism and, and be funny at the same time. I, I totally blew it. Um, but I think it's a useful, um, uh, experience for someone to have, even though it certainly doesn't feel that way in the moment. Cause in the moment I, I've, I used to stand up like for six months, like a very long time ago. And one of the reasons I quit is there's a lack of continuity because one night you'll kill and the next night with the same material, you'll walk the room. So it really is a mind fuck. Can you talk a bit about that traumatic experience the first time you went up there and just completely bombed? Because it feels like you're there for three hours. Like you want to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, especially when you're first starting out, you will take any gig you can, especially right. if, if all you're doing are open mics. You know, you're doing open mics, so you're spending all of your time basically just talking to other comics who are just waiting to get up on their microphone so they can't be looked at the same way that they're not paying attention to you. So anytime that you get a gig that, that you get an opportunity to do, to play in front of quote unquote, you know, real people, like you, you take it. And, and I'm very, I'm kind of still of that mindset. Like I, I just like, like, where's the gig? Okay. Let's see how I can get there and I'll go there. And, um, this, uh, this gig, uh, was at, uh, a fashion show slash sex toy, I don't know, uh, exhibit in the back of a bar in like bed -Stuy. And uh, I thought it was going to be a comedy show. And um, the uh, the guy who booked me, he had seen me perform on another show. And, he, and then he had said, I want to see how you do for my people. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm like, my people, that sounds... That, that sounds nice. Um, <laughs> sounds nice. That sounds nice. My people. Oh, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's a supportive group. You know, we're not alone in the world, Michael. It's my people. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, so I go to this thing. It's running real. It, it's, I don't know when the hell it's going to start. And uh, there's a host who he has a name. He calls himself time of your life. The host name is time of your life. And he gets up there and I'm like, okay, cool. Time of your life is going to warm up this crowd. And he basically says, hey, what's up? Got a guy coming up to do comedy right now. So he brings me up and it's me. And I'm like, it's, it's an all black room who they had like no idea that comedy was going to happen. And everything, <laughs> and, it <wasn't. laughs> and it was not going to happen. Every single thing that came out of my mouth, right? just like fell to the floor just terrible and and i was you know i was i, I saw it was, oh it's a black room like maybe they'll like some obama jokes you know and um and i opened up with and i said hey you know i, I gotta tell you i feel like president obama right now because i have the opportunity to disappoint so many black people and michael i disappointed all of them not in that <laughs> And it was just one thing after another. I did like a Mitt Romney joke. I did, you know, I was just trying everything. I, I think I was, I was supposed to do eight minutes. It felt like a half hour and maybe I did three. And then uh, I, I, I was, Wait, Hold on, hold yeah, on. Keep Let's going, keep going, down. keep hitting me. Yeah. Because I, I've been there. Well, not for that, the, the, the black audience, but just when, when you you know that's a good that's first of all that's a, that's a decent joke right so that's not at all like a hack joke that that's a clever joke so you're gonna think okay this room's cold they're not ready to laugh fine i'm gonna hit them with this they'll see okay i kind of broken the ice right and you i'm sure there was that pause where you're like all right let's two or three people are gonna laugh and then there's it's like a library yeah. right this is this you created the one time where black people are not yelling at the stage this this is the opposite of the movie theater and you're sitting there and what can you i'm sure you remember that exact moment when that joke completely bombs 
And then your brain goes into panic because it's like, choose your own adventure. I'm like, I thought this was a sure thing. Whatever I have left is going to be less likely to hit. Like, can you just describe that feeling for people who don't know what it's like? It, it feels like you're, you're more than alone. <laughs> like, and you know, that's where if people are trying to, you know, figure out the, the difference between like improv and stand up, it's like, well, obviously, you know, you're, you're by yourself doing, you know, stand up and you have a team, but like when, when you're bombing as a team, you got each other, you got my people, all my people, you know, we're, we're all, we're all in it together. And when you're and bombing it's, alone and it's, and it's a learning experience, right? If this yeah. team bombs, you go back and you're like, why didn't that work? What could we fix? And the audience also knows this is live. You're doing it off the cuff. So there's more of a like, okay, this is bad improv. We've all seen it. They're, they're not as annoyed. Right. Right. Um, and you know, I, I wish I could say that there was, that there was any emotion from this audience other than just silence. Like, like if at least if someone was like, get the fuck off the stage yeah, or something yeah. like that, you'd be like, Oh, okay, cool. That's something, uh, we've connected in some way. Yeah. I right? could work with this. I, I could work with this. No, Michael, no, there, there wasn't, there was any of that. And, and I did like a, like a, a walk of a walk of shame out to the bar and, yeah, Did it, they applaud when you got up the stage? I, I don't remember. Because <laughs> you go into this fugue state, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I don't know how I, I I got home and I cooked a turkey dinner and I don't remember anything. No, I have I have no clue. But 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 what hurt? What hurt was um, I, I I walked out. I was at the bar uh, and apparently they were pumping in uh, the PA, you know, into the bar area, and like the only like white guys there turned to me and said, good job, man. And it was like, why are you guys here? Like, like, why, why are you guys even here? You know, why are you lying to me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why are you lying to me? Um, and there's been times in my life when I've needed those lies and I did not get those lies. <laughs> so. Um, what's it like? So what's it like being one of the things you always talk about is becoming a dad in this book. Um, What's it like being a funny dad? It, it, I mean, that must be a, just a really great joy getting your kids to crack up. Well, what, well, what's really funny is that, uh, at least from, from my first son, uh, I could not make him laugh like the first year of what, his Well, he life. didn't like the Obama jokes? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> he was not a fan of the Obama joke. Maybe I should have tried the Romney. I yeah. should have went back, should have tried the Romney once on him. Uh, but my wife would crack him up. Like my wife would have him go, have him howling. And, uh, you know, so, so that was, you know, so, so that was something, uh, something to it. Um, I think, I think one of the, one of the really cool things about, about being a dad and something I had to, I had to remind myself is that every single thing is new for them. Yeah. Yeah. Every single thing. Like um, when I think it was a couple of weeks after, after he was born, I, I held him and listened to uh, was it the Ronettes uh, uh, "Be My Baby," and it was like this is the first time he was hearing you know this amazing song, and it was the first time that it was always almost like the first time I was experiencing it through him. Yeah, you know. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like that that I, that I think is is great. I mean, as far as you know comedy and 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 laughs i, I gotta work on my material for my boys for for sure man i gotta i gotta i gotta i, gotta, I need some more open mics or something <laughs> that's because that joke isn't funny anymore <laughs> there we go um one of the things uh i've been um <clears throat> uh hearing about publishing is that traditional publishing is really in the sewer it's getting worse and worse uh, that it's almost impossible for someone, unless they're like a, a Kardashian, to get a book deal. Can you talk a bit about the process of how you got this deal? Yeah. So um, uh, at the end of uh, 2020, uh, I wrote an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, and it was called uh, How I Became a Far-Right Radical. And um, uh, the article uh, is reprinted in the book, and I added um, some more to it because there was more to to that story. And um, on Facebook, I noticed that uh, I was I was friends with uh, someone who was who was a publisher, and I was thinking like, man, wouldn't it be cool if I if I you know if I sent him a message with my article and he was like, you know, you should write a book, and I was like, let me give it a shot, 
so I sent him a message like, Hey, you know, I, I just had this publish, uh, you know, love you, love for you to check it out. Wait, was it Adam? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, David. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and when you know, he got back to me, he said, yeah, you should write a book. And I was like, what, what? this is a, th th this was, it, it was, it was that easy um to you know uh you said you know you should you should write a book and you know then we uh went back and forth back and forth about you know the pitch and and what you know what the book would look like and all that um but i i have to say i mean this is my this is my first book my first time you know uh you know in this industry and i had a i had a really positive experience with the whole thing at, at one point you know early on i asked him you know so uh you know, so what do you think I should write? He's like, well, write the book you, you want to write, which was an amazing, you know, gift to be given. But then it's also really scary when it's your first book and you're like, oh my God, what, what do I want this book to be? You know, it's still like so nebulous, you know? So you never had an agent? Never had an agent, still don't. Wow, that's really uh, uh, unusual because it, not that long ago, if you did not have an agent, you cannot, they won't take your call. Like there, there was very much this kind of gate gatekeeper kind of situation. I know David Bombardier is, is trying to do something different and he's looking for like unique independent right of center voices, but I, I'm still um, surprised that that happened. So that's a very fortuitous thing that happened for you. Yeah. Oh, no, no, totally. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I have no idea what, you know, what the process is like after this, you know, if, you know, I, I, whether, you know, I should talk to you about this too, about, you know, representation versus no representation etc cetera, etc cetera. um what i mean sitting down to write a book when you've never done it is something that's extremely daunting uh and it's even more daunting than bombing on stage can you talk about how you kind of figured out what you wanted to do and how you want to put this together yeah so so at first you know book you're like i don't think i have enough thoughts or words to, 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 to make a book, you know, how, how's this going, you know, how's this going to happen? And then, uh, what I, what I started to look at, I, I said, um, okay, well, I've had some, some pieces that have been published, uh, in the, in the past in like spiked magazine and the spectator that, you know, deal with comedy and free speech and cancel culture and that sort of thing. And I'm like, okay, what if, if those were together? Okay. That, you know, that, that's a few pages there. And then I started looking at just lists of, either kind of like comedic monologues or just ideas that I've had for like, you know, 800 word pieces that, I, that I'd like to write and, you know, sort of put those uh, all together. And then uh, I, I was very in my head uh, at the, at the start, like trying to, you know, perfect each sentence yeah. and going over and over. And, you know, when I, when I started looking, I'm like, look, I only have a few, you know, so many months to turn in a first draft. I'm like, I can't get bogged down with this. So I did what I, what I do when I'm trying to write, um, spec scripts or features or, um, um, you know, sitcom scripts, which is like, okay, look, I'm going to get out a vomit draft. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to put a, a, you know, a really basic outline. Okay. Here's like a title, title, title. And I'm just going to write and write and write and write. And then at the end of it, you know, you have like 300 completely unusable pages, but it's there and you have your, you have your stuff there. And then I read it over, start making cuts, notes, and that sort of thing. And then little by little, you start chipping and chipping and chipping. And, uh, the first chapter was the one that, that took me the longest to write because my publisher kept sending it back and saying like, nah, we needs needs more work, needs more work, needs more work. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of the, uh, yeah, that was sort of the process. I, I think in a, in a way it, it's kind of like, Anytime you're doing anything creative, uh, you know, trying to perfect it right out the gate is going to get in the way that you really need to just just put it out there and um, and then know that you could always go back and, and, and fix. One of the things I learned in this book, I didn't watch the Roger Stone documentary, um, but you in the chapter about Cox, you Roger Stone is a cuck and he used to have these swinger part and he talks about this in the documentary apparently and watch dudes plow his girlfriend or wife oh yeah yeah they, they're, they're a part of the lifestyle the uh and I, I didn't know that it was called the lifestyle until i watched this uh this doc documentary so for those of you out there like 
whether you like Roger Stone or you don't like him, you you cannot deny that he is an interesting man. He is a very interesting dude with a really uh, really interesting uh, story. And yeah, that that's in the um, the chapter Alpha Cuck um, because it, it, you know sort of going back to you know the way that that people respond to my trolling uh, in in particular when it's uh, uh, when it's somebody on on the left who's offended. Uh, it's it's often they get the joke but they don't think it's funny and they think I'm a bad right. person for telling it. When I offend somebody on the right, they don't get the joke. They don't think it's funny and they think they can kick my ass. So it's like a very like aggressive, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of thing. So, um, and, and, you know, at the, at the time, the, you know, the parlance was always, you know, any, um, uh, any man you disagreed with on the left must be a cuck. So you got to call him that. So. Uh, something else that my, I think one of my favorite lines in this book was when you were talking about how, gun rights and uh, <laughs> you know the, the, you see this all the time on twitter from marginally intelligent women that oh you want a gun to compensate for your small penis and then you're <laughs> like well i guess you're, you're having when women are compensating for having no penis uh do i have your permission to steal that line that the only reason you have guns is because you're jealous that you don't have a penis to tell these women do it do it yeah because they're not gonna know what to say it's really <laughs> kind of hilarious Hey guys, Michael Malice here. What if you didn't have to pay healthcare premiums, but you could invest in Bitcoin instead? When health insurance companies invest your premiums, they're the ones reaping the rewards, not you. With CrowdHealth, you put the money aside for health expenses in your own account and even hold part of it in Bitcoin. The best part is if Bitcoin goes up, you get the upside, not that big insurance company. And you'll be part of the CrowdHealth community who are there to help if a big expense comes up. Here's why healthcare bills are so high. The buyers of healthcare and the sales of healthcare want costs to rise. Obamacare limits the amount of profit they make. So on $1,000 of monthly premiums, they can make $150. So they can only increase their profits by raising your price. Here's how CrowdHealth works. You pay one low monthly total, less than $200 most of the time, to fund an account that's yours. You can hold up to 75% of it in Bitcoin if you want. You choose what doctor you want. And if you have a big bill, CrowdHealth will crowdfund that bill for you so you can pay the doctor hospital quickly. You have a personal care advocate who takes care of your questions. Kiss big call centers goodbye. Just schedule a call with your care advocate. You talk to the same person every day. Stop supporting the broken healthcare system with your hard-earned dollars. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash welcome now and experience freedom from health insurance by utilizing Bitcoin. Right now, you get your first six months for just $99 a month. That's almost 50% off the normal price and a lot less than a high deductible healthcare plan. Just go to crowdhealth.com slash welcome to sign up. That's crowdhealth.com slash welcome. Crowdhealth is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for healthcare. Terms and conditions may apply. If you're like me, you're growing more and more concerned about the future inflations at its highest level in 40 years. Interest rates are skyrocketing. Market experts like Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of JP Morgan, not only predict a recession, but are using terms like economic hurricane and unprecedented. If you want to protect your future, call the best precious metal dealers out there, which is American Hartford Gold. They can show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. All it takes to get started is a short phone call, and they'll have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k. They make it easy. The highest rated firm in the country with an A-plus rating from the BBB and thousands of satisfied clients. If you call them right now, they'll give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. Don't wait. Call them now. Call 866-599-5502. That's 866-599-5502. Or text Michael to 65532. Again, that's 866-599-5502. Or text Michael to 65532. Let's get back to the show. Um, what? So how do you handle it? And like if you're doing political comedy, but the audience doesn't really isn't really political like like that's got to be a really difficult like road to kind of road a kind of hoe yeah well, well i think i think it's really important to have material that just isn't political um you know and i think uh you, you know when, when when you live long enough when you date when you're married when you have kids the material is going to be there for you to you know uh to, to go to and yeah and, and it is important to you know see the crowd that you're uh, you know, that, that you're performing for. So like I performed at, at, um, uh, the porcupine festival this year, pork fest, for the yeah. new state project, uh, free state project, uh, freedom fest as well. So when I, when I'm going into that, I, I already understand that I don't have to like 
define what a libertarian is, you know, or, you know, we're already starting from a, from a place of, okay, you, you know, we get each other. Um, whereas if you're performing for like a, you know, a, you know, a normal crowd at a comedy club, it might not even be worth like doing that material because right. it's like, it's like, well, are, are they really going to care about the time that I went to, you know, Liberty forum and blah, blah, blah. No, probably not. Um, but, but I think it's, I think it's important to, you know, have, um, you know, have all different types of material, uh, obviously that, that you can use. How did, um, the whole COVID and the lockdowns thing affect you as a comedian? At, as a comedian, you know, uh, I had a friend, I had a friend of mine who, uh, he DM'd me, um, uh, because he'd been following me on Twitter for a while. He's a really great guy, really great supporter. And he said, Hey man, you know, I, I kind of noticed, you know, over the past, you know, few months, um, you be a lot lighthearted with stuff. There's like a lot of light there. And he's like, you've, you've gotten kind of dark with a lot of the stuff that you're, that you've been putting out. And I didn't realize that. And I didn't, you know, I think, I think oftentimes, you know, when you're, you know, just going about your day, you don't necessarily know, you, you don't really know, what you're putting out there and what others are seeing. And that at least that was the case with me. And I looked back and I'm like, Oh my God, you know, you're right. Like I have, I have been putting out a lot of dark stuff and I, it definitely came about, you know, with the, with the COVID stuff. Um, very early on in, uh, we went on uh, that little tour in February of, uh, of 2020 and my son was born in March and leading up to that, it was like the week before he was born there was a possibility I wasn't even going to be allowed in the, in, in the, in the room, you know, to, to, to witness his birth. And there were a lot of hospitals that denied husbands and fathers of the children from being in that room. Um, my wife and I knew, know a woman who she gave birth alone without her husband and had a C-section. And this poor woman had to like recover. She did in it herself? <laughs> Get this thing out of me. <laughs> I got to give you a hand on that one, Michael. Um, <laughs> you know, so so that that's like the world we were living in, you know, at the time where there was a possibility that I wouldn't even be allowed in to see, you know, to, to see my kid. And then 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 he's born. And then it's like it's a complete dystopia. We don't know what's going on. People are dying and, and all this. It really was out of it. And um and but throughout it all, I was looking for hope. You know, I was looking for good news. You know, hey, you find out that you know what kids are really affected by this. Amazing. Well, what you know, what great news that that is. Hey, it's okay to be out. It's okay to be outside. It's healthy to be outside. Great. We're taking walks and we're doing all that. And what I was in my neighborhood in Brooklyn and Brooklyn Heights, it was like nobody wanted good news. Nobody wanted hope. Everybody wanted to you know you know, be, you know, kind of at the end of the world and treat people as if, uh, as if they were, you know, assholes at, at, at least, or at worst murderers who want yeah. them, want them dead from just trying to, to live their life. So I think, you know, I think it, my, my comedy, the, uh, um, you know, uh, during those times and, uh, you know, who knows if we'll go back <laughs> wherever it is now. Yeah, I remember vividly one of my favorite moments during COVID was it really empowered the worst kind of people. Karen was like queen. Mm -hmm. And I was in Park Slope and this Karen was, she was like a woman in her 50s. And there were two guys loading a van like on the street. So they were like in fresh air and so on and so forth. And th listen, this is hard work, you know, loading a van. It's yeah. physically, you got a breath, whatever. And she yells at them. She's like, you guys should be wearing a masks. And I just say immediately, lady, you don't need a mask. You need a muzzle. And they start cracking up at her. And she just starts walking fast. Didn't want to look behind her because now, like, instead of her being in charge, she's the punchline. And, and there is, like, laughter surrounding her. And I'm sure she went home and went on Facebook and complained to all her um, awful friends and her cats. But it it, it really uh, – I, I, I hope people don't forget um, how it brought out – like the worst uh, for the worst people. Uh, and it just really gave them this permission to just be just completely nasty for no reason, uh, which is something I like to do in general, uh, but not in this kind of way. Yeah. And, and 
uh, and very early on, I would try to have conversations with people like that. I, I uh, there was um, uh, my my wife and I. We were we were uh, walking with our son down the street, empty street, and at the end of the block was a uh, older man with a mask, and we weren't wearing masks. And he crossed into the middle of the street and walked up the middle of the street away from us, and turned to me, got my attention, and said, "Why don't you show some respect?" show some respect by, by wearing a mask. And I tried to explain him. I said, I said, no, look, sir, we're, we're outside. We're social distancing. Like it's okay. You don't have to worry about it. He's like, Oh, what are you a genius that you have to be a genius to know that walking outside when I'm not anywhere near you. And right. you know, I, I, I'm not a threat to you. And if it eventually got to the point where I was like, these people cannot be reasoned with, right. And the only way to respond to them is with derision. And there was there was one time where I was uh, I was coming back from the gym and a guy on a bicycle stopped me uh, or tried to. He was, you know, in the middle of the street. He, he said, hey, where's your mask? And I just yelled, fuck you, pussy. Oh, and that's pretty clever. Which, which <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's that improv skills. <laughs> I'll tell you a lot, Michael. Um, you should hit him with the Obama joke. <laughs> I should... <laughs> I'm going to hit you with the Obama joke. I, it's amazing how I delivered that. that. Shut him up. Fuck he yeah. wouldn't say I, another I, word. <laughs> he say no. Oh my God, exactly. He would just bring on Tommy of life again. Here we go. Oh my God. But yeah, no, it got, it got to the point where there were ugly things like that happening where it's just like, no, I can't be nice to you people anymore. What, to, uh, what was it like for you and your family moving from Brooklyn to the boonies, so to speak? You know, everybody thought that I would that I would have a tough time, uh, you know, adapting to it. You know, we were we were we were living in a one bedroom apartment um, where really our whole social world was my wife, me, and my son, and uh, the grandparents. So it was like on the weekends, on Saturday we would see her parents, on Sunday we'd see our parents. Our world was very small, and we became very close, and you know. There were so many things you couldn't go to. You can go to, you know, restaurants for the most part and, and all that. And uh, we, you know, we were, you know, kind of there for the fall of New York City, you know, so it made the transition a lot easier. You know, for one, we're used to being with each other. We like being with each other. And then two, it's not like we left before the pandemic. And so we have like all of the, you know, right, you know, all it's like, oh man, we got to go back to that place. It's like, well, no, we, we can't go back to the place because we were living there when that place was no longer there, yeah. you know, when that place closed down. And, um, so, so that, that, it, so I, I could say, like, I honestly enjoy living, you know, living where I'm living and that, how did you even think to go to like Jersey of all places? Oh, my, that's where my wife's from. So her hometown. Oh yeah. So it, it made it, uh, it made it easier. And, and we were, um, uh, you know, we were looking, you know, for places in like, I don't know if you're familiar like with Westfield, but there's like yeah. nice, nice places in Jersey. And uh, we found out like what you can get for a home, you know, all the way out here versus, you know, versus there. So like the goes a little you know, farther here as far as, you know, getting, you know, property and, and all that. Yeah, I, I it's it's really a blessing for me also, you know, here in Austin, I just. Uh, find myself so fortunate i have a huge house all to myself um uh and it's 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 it, like i don't miss the new york that i left at all i miss the new york that no longer exists um but even still it's just it's been such an upgrade like just last week i was at um kill tony which is tony hinchcliffe's mm -hmm. uh, show and it was I, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I think I'm not allowed to say who the, the people were. Someone yelled at me. I put up an Instagram and I pulled it, but there were these two, uh, um, uh, major comics were on the panel and then someone else comes out. It was this whole kind of scene. And I'm like, this is what New York used to be like, like mm -hmm. where you never know who's going to come up on that stage. And now, you know, who's going to come up on that stage. There's like no, no sense of, uh, uh, of surprise anymore. Yeah. Okay, great work, Lou. <laughs> oh, 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 wait, wait a second. Hold on. Uh, yes, I feel and. like this is an Obama yes, right not, now. Not yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah. Well, I noticed that up in up in New Hampshire during uh, during the pandemic <laughs> when uh, I went up and, and did a show uh, over at um, uh, at the Shell, uh, and um, you know nobody's wearing masks. 
and it felt normal and it was yeah. weird it was weird that it was normal like yeah. everybody was just you know just living their lives and i'm like you have no idea what we just left you know we just drove like six hours you know to uh, to to come and find up here are if they roll out I, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to but i'm just very curious as someone who's a dad and who's red pilled if they are rolling out vaccines for like toddlers and like young kids are you going to uh give your kids the jab no 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 i'm, I'm not yeah okay and not yeah yeah not not this one and and i'm not i'm you know i'm not someone who's you know anti you know vaccination you know uh i don't like rubella and right you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff um but but no as as for this one I, I i don't feel uh comfortable so yeah i don't the thing i don't understand about it is you take the measles shot chicken whatever the the mumps the kids set for life right but with this it's going to last six months or whatever it is it's like wait so the argument is this toddler or this one-year-old two-year-old is going to get traumatized because when you're a kid you know what a shot's like it, it ruins you freaks yeah. you the heck out what in perpetuity that that seems for something that they can't even catch that seems crazy to me yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 something to where look i i'm I'll, I'll admit that i'm i'm vaccinated and uh or at least i you know i i got the vaccination when it when it came out and right the reason the reason why i did was because um i have elderly parents and uh i was also scared at the time and i was yeah. told if you get this you don't have to worry about catching it and you don't have to worry right. about spreading it you know and i and it's something that i don't think people hit enough where it's like look i'm i'm not you know i'm i'm a i'm a reasonable person who was you know i was i wanted the safety of of myself and my loved ones and i believed you when you said this and you know and and here we are so. yeah um uh do you think things are getting better in terms of like things like cancel culture and comedy or you think they're, they're, they're we got a long way to go before the ship turns around i think things are getting better and i think it, it, and partly because you know i i when I go online, I'm seeing all these comedians who I like a lot doing well, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Long and Tim Dillon and uh, Kyle Duncan and, you know, all these people. I think I think that's probably, you know, what makes me so hopeful about about comedy is that the audience is out there and the audience has a way to support you now, you know, thankfully. And, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about gatekeepers anymore. And, um, and yeah, so I, I think, I think it's, it's, you know, if, if, if anybody comes away with anything in my book, I'm just, I just want, uh, I just want them to know that, that there is a future of comedy here, but we have to, uh, you know, speak up and also support each other. Why can you explain to me why improv is often so bad? Like, like just excruciatingly bad because even someone who's like a bad comic, at least it's like, okay, it, it there's something there but like when you see bad improv you just you just cringe on behalf of the people on the stage you would think there'd be at least one guy who could turn it around yeah i think i think i think one of the big reasons why is because for a lot of people improv is a it's a social affair um there um, aren't real there aren't necessarily intentions of like going on tour or you know even getting to movies and stuff like that um it's a way of I'm going to get together with my friends and we're oftentimes going to be making each other laugh, which that could be painful too. When you look at the group and they're all laughing and the audience is looking at each other, like what the, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Whereas I think with, with stand up, well, you have people who, you know, who might just enjoy doing it, you know, every now and then for the most part, there is a goal there. There everyone who gets into stand up or at least stays in, in it after a few years, they want to be booking gigs. They want to be, you know, hitting the road eventually. They want to be getting paid to do what they're, uh, what they're doing. Yeah, that, that actually makes sense. My favorite comedian, Neil Hamburger, uh, a lot of his material, especially his early material was anti-comedy um, and where the, the audience is basically the punchline where the jokes didn't even make sense. Like, uh, uh, you know, what state did my ex-wife run off to with her tennis instructor? I don't know, but when I see her in court next month, Alaska, and like it's just excruciatingly painful, but like on purpose. But I, I, I said this story before. I remember seeing him um, in LA, and there was a, some basic bitch girl on a date with her boyfriend on the table ahead of me, and he drops one of these lines, and she turns to him and she goes, "What is this?" And like, <laughs> that was one of the greatest 
like comic moments I ever got to experience that this girl was in this state of like existential confusion, like watching him bomb intentionally. Yeah, there, there's something uh, about those kinds of comedians that that mentality, um, you know, knowing that you want to that you're going to get up on stage and you want to have that effect on people. Because um, when I when I get up there, I, I, I want to make people laugh, you know, um, but, you know, you hear stories about like guys like, you know, Andrew Dice Clay and, you know, even Jim Carrey, you know, walking like just spending like hours on stage walking people. Um, and th there's something there that I think is interesting and and kind of, a, you know, dangerous and also something I don't get, you know. Well, what do you mean? Um, I don't understand why you'd want to do that as opposed to just like really make people laugh. Um, on, oh, I see on, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and, and it might be something, you know, maybe there's a point where you get so good at making people laugh that you're like, oh, all right, let me fuck with them. Well, I think that's the, the classic example of this was Norm MacDonald during the Bob Saget roast, where mm -hmm. instead, because Norm MacDonald, everyone loves Norm MacDonald, um, with yeah. one exception I could think of. And he just read, he didn't have the book in front of him, but these like 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 joke books from like 1950s. Like, oh, he, he, you know, Susie Essman, she's got, you know, the neck of a swan and the eyes of an eagle. I, I guess you could say she's for the birds. And like the audience was just like sitting on their hands, but like the, the comedians on the, on the dais right. were just losing their minds. Yeah. 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 But with, uh, yeah, with writing this book, one of the, you know, I kind of had like a, a ticker going off because like I turned in a draft and then like, I, I think I forget who I forget which order it was, but it was like Paul Mooney died and Mort Saul and Norm MacDonald and Louis Anderson and, and, and Gilbert Gottfried. I'm like Bob Saget. And it's like, holy shit, I really I need to get this book out there. And I think that was part of like the stress of it. I was like, fuck, man, I got to get out before more, more comics die. Jeez. Yeah. Um, uh, what are you most excited about with the, the book release? I think what, what I'm most excited about is, uh, I don't know, getting to talk about, getting to talk about the book. I mean, well, no, actually, uh, actually today somebody ordered the book and took a screen grab of a line from the book that they really liked and shared it online. And I was like, that's friggin' amazing because this is over a year in the making. And yeah. Somebody was able to get the Kindle right now and they read the first two chapters they really liked and said, especially this line. And I was like, you know, it's the kind of like validation that, that I, that I wanted, you know, it's like, man, I put so much work into this and as somebody's digging it, you know, I'm like, man, that, that feels really good. I saw you just recently did Deborah, Dr. Deborah Stowe's show. Uh, I am good friends with her. I think she's absolutely terrific. And I pride myself on being one of the very few people who can get her to break character and actually start laughing. Um, did you get her to break? No, well, well, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Deborah and I, uh, we did a uh, a series together for We the Internet. That's right. Yeah, sex, gender, uh, sex, gender, and bullshit. And she is an amazing straight man. Like she, yeah, she she makes fun of herself. She's like she has a resting bitch face, but she's not a bitch at all. Like she's no, a really sweet. She's a great person, she's a sweet person. And it was just a perfect dynamic, uh, the two of us, me being the clown and her just, you know, staring daggers at me. Um, I, I, I don't know if, did I make her, I'm not sure if I made her laugh uh, this uh, this time around, but uh, yeah, that'll definitely be a goal in the future. So. When I did her show, I went to like, I think it was literally seven stores to get a carrot with the greens at the end of it. And I couldn't find one because I opened the show chewing in the carrot saying, what's up, doc? Um, and that got her to break, but I guess I'm also a prop comic now, or I guess I'm a comic and a prop comic, uh, uh as a result of that. But, but, uh, I, I suggest people go in and watch that interview because she's just absolutely amazing. Uh, um, and, and, uh, it must've been a lot of fun for you. Yeah. She's, she's awesome. And, and she's somebody that I, I really look up to. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that my hottest takes can be can can be followed by punchlines, you know. Whereas she's really going out there and 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 speaking the truth and 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 putting herself out there to you know to great you know to great risk. Um, on our on on our episode, she opens it by talking about um, oh a word from our sponsors. She doesn't have any for that episode because two of them dropped her because of her wow. controversial stuff. Yeah, 
Yeah. Wow, that's very disturbing to hear. I did not know that. And she's an academic, so it's not like she's out there just being opinionated, you know, like oh blah blah blah. She or like she's very big on her views being research based, data based, science based, uh, and not just like her opinions on, and so on and so forth. So that that's very disappointing to hear. Yeah. Um, have you been touring much? Is there any chance you're going to get your uh, uh, Latinx ass to Austin? I would love to get my Latin, my, my Latin uh, to, uh, to Austin. That, that would be fun. Um, yeah, I'm looking to, um, you know, uh, get some uh, dates set up. And, you know, if anybody out there has a microphone in a room full of people, my people, <laughs> with that time, Lou, of, the, give you the time, time of, of your life. life. I will give you the time of your life and a lot of Mitt Romney jokes, baby. Um, You're a modern day Dave Smith. There, there we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> Uh, Lou, running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, my favorite part is uh, knowing that you read my book and that you have a uh, favorite line from it. It really means a lot to me. And uh, thank you. You are welcome. Welcome to The Inevitable. This is Motor Trend's new podcast about the future of the automobile. I am Johnny Lieberman, the senior features editor at Motor Trend, and I am joined every week by my co-host, Mr. Ed Lowe. That's me. I'm the head of editorial for Motor Trend, and boy, do we have an amazing list of guests that we're going to be chatting with. We've got the godfather of the environmental movement, Ed Bagley Jr. Derek Jenkins, a whole bunch of actors, celebrities, car crazy folks, people from in and outside the industry. Can't wait for you to join us. We're talking about the future of the car. This means everything from electrified vehicles to cars that drive themselves. Come check us out. We're on podcastone.com or anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. We're also on motortrend.com and youtube.com slash motortrend. Saddle up and get ready for Westerns Weeks on Pluto TV, all for free. We're coming in blazing with favorites like True Grit and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Or immerse yourself in binge-worthy series like Yellowstone and Walker, Texas Ranger. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. The best part? It's free. No credit card, no sign-up, no fees. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now.